I want to invite you to reach and grab your copy of God's Word. And uh, happy Father's Day, dads. And uh, certainly as uh, I began uh, preaching today, uh, a message entitled, How to Become a Strong Family. Uh, we certainly, uh, either viewing online or in here, we have a number of different families and family units in here. And so we understand uh, that, that certainly we have those that are in the room uh, that uh, you're a traditional family, what we would refer to as a traditional family, first husband, first wife. Uh, and even within those, we have those that are uh, first husband, first wife, that you are at the top of your game as a family. It is all great and it is all good and we celebrate that. We certainly know there are others here today uh, uh, that uh, you're in that same situation, first husband, first wife, uh, but you're struggling. These are seasons of difficulty, hardship. Uh, it just, it's just not clicking. You ever been one of those seasons? It just doesn't seem like uh, it's clicking. There are others in here that you are blended families. You are second marriage, and uh, you're trying to put the kids together, and, uh, trying to get them to like each other, and the reality of it is kids that are actually blood-related don't like each other. How do you mix ones that aren't blood-related, right? How do you put those together? Uh, we know that there are single moms in the room that you are trying to journey, uh, uh, make your journey uh, without dad in the home. And there are many, many uh, that are like that. There are other single fathers here in the room that you are bringing your kids, doing everything you can to raise your kids. There are also singles here. And there is a reality that sometimes uh, in, um, in the world today, or even sometimes in churches today, uh, that we think singleness somehow is less than. But I want you to know, if that's where God has you right now, that is an okay thing. And so regardless of where your family is today, I want to encourage you with this message, how to have a strong family. Now, that's the way I titled the sermon. I will tell you that uh, the two people that keep me most in line in my life are my wife, Gina, and she's got a full-time job, and April, she's here. Uh, she is my boss. Uh, uh, some refer to her as the pastor's admin. In other words, she tells me what to do. And on Friday, as I was titling this, I just we, we've been in a series entitled, I Pity the Fool. How many of you know that? And she called me and she goes, do you really want to name the title of your Father's Day sermon, I Pity the Fool. And I thought it seems perfect for most of us, right? Right? And she goes, no, I don't think you want to do that. I said, all right, all right, I got another idea. How about I pity the father who doesn't end well? I said, that's kind of a grace thing. You know, it doesn't matter where you are. It matters where you end up. And she goes, I really think you just need to drop the pity the fool altogether. And I said, okay. So we went with uh, how to build a strong family. You know, there, there is um, the truth that uh, every year when studies are done, uh, that the disparity between those who celebrate Mother's Day and those who celebrate Father's Day is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Every year, the percentages of people that celebrate Father's Day are smaller and smaller and smaller. And sadly, that's probably a reflection on fathers, right? It's a reflection on dads who are there or, or who were there and are no longer there, or that dads who have just left, or dads who were never there to begin with. And so my encouragement to you today, Dad, is regardless of where you are in your faith and in your family, in your walk, is that you can begin today to build a strong family. When we look at that word, and I just did some research this week on that word father uh, in uh, the Bible. The, fa the word father is used over 1,500 times from Genesis to Revelation. I mean, over 1,500 and almost 900 verses. So that word father is significant. It means a lot. If you look in the New Testament, Jesus used that word father 445 times. As a matter of fact, dads, this may encourage, it may not. Uh, if you look at the Greek word, uh, the second primary definition of the Greek word gets its derivation from a word that means one with deep pockets. <laughs> and so dads, if nothing else, if it wasn't important enough, also if you look through the gospels, when Jesus referred to God he almost exclusively referred to God as Father. Remember when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray to the Father? Or is, what was his first statement? He says, pray then in this way, our what? Our Father. 
So that word father is important. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. I want to just uh, uh, set kind of the bar for us today as we look at it and as we think about it. Here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. It says, the righteous lead blameless lives. We're back to Proverbs. We've been studying the Proverbs, and we will all through the summer. The righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. Now, that is the bar. That is, uh, that is really the bar for us to look to, ch- to achieve, dads. But there is a reality some of us haven't gotten there. Uh, I ran across one person who was talking about fatherhood on Father's Day. He says, fatherhood is a lot like golf. It's always changing what you do. In other words, in golf, you have to change your swing, you have to change your clubs, you have to do different things, you have to decide to play a hole differently based on your drive. Then he went on, he says, not only is it more like golf, he says, if you want to be good at it, you got to do it more than once a year. Dads, that's a challenge and an encouragement to us, that if we want to be good at this fathering thing, we've got to do it more than once a year. We've got to be there every day, every Sunday, every week, and every year. But back to those words in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7, that is the bar. The righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. But there is a truth that wherever you are, men or women here today, single or married, first marriage, second marriage, blended marriage, single mom, single dad, or single, There is a reality that every person in this room got to today from many different trajectories. I love what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, and we'll put it up on the screen. Notice what Paul says. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but the one thing I do is that I forget what is behind and I strain forward to what is ahead. Therefore, he says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. We could have all gotten to today by a multitude of trajectories. Uh, There could be many in this room or several in this room or even a hundred in this room, men or women, that you are Proverbs chapter 20 verse 7. You have led a blameless life. You are like Joseph in the Old Testament. If you remember Joseph's story, sold into slavery by his brother, uh, Potiphar's house, in prison and forgotten, all the way up to number two behind Pharaoh in Egypt. And if you track Joseph in every area of his life, in good seasons and bad seasons, in, 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 in hard times and good times, in every area, Joseph led a blameless life. And there could be men that you are here today and you have lived a blameless life and your trajectory is much like Joseph as you sit here today and your children are blessed. There are others who might, uh, your life might reflect more David's. Remember David in the Old Testament? David, a man after God's own heart. David wrote many of the songs, taught us how to worship God, but he also taught us how to confess, right? Remember, for all the good that David did, David was also an adulterer and a murderer. By the way, if y'all don't know, those are two biggies. They're in the Ten Commandments, right? But David taught us how to confess and repent. And so there might be some men that you have lived your lives and you arrived today, or some ladies, you've arrived today as Joseph and you've lived a blameless life. There are others who you might have arrived today and you are here like David. You can look back over your life. I've confessed my sins, but if I look back in your life or if you look back in your life or others look back in your life, they will see some big failures. There are others that your trajectory might be to this day more like Samson. How many of you remember Samson in the Old Testament? It was one failure after another failure after another failure after another failure after another failure. And that might have been your trajectory to today. But here's good news, men, if you are here like Samson... The beautiful thing is God's grace is available. You are not at the temple columns of Dagon, and your only option left is to pull down the columns and the Colosseum on yourself. 
And those are the words that Paul is expressing in Philippians chapter 3 there. He says, I am going to forget what is behind. I'm going to strive forward to what is ahead. So if you've arrived today and you have lived your life, men or women like Joseph, with uprightness and integrity and blamelessness, God bless you. But the Apostle Paul says, forgetting what lies, uh, lies behind, our strain forward to what is ahead. If you are like David, if most of what you've done in your life has been to produce good and to do good and to worship God, but you can look back on some past failures like you have, I want to encourage you with the words of Philippians 3, forgetting what lies behind straining forward to what lies ahead if you are here today and you are Samson you are not at a season and a place where you have to bring down the Colosseum on your head all you have to do is do as David did is confess and ask God to bless you so how are we going to build a strong family look at 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 13 and 14 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 13 and 14 we're gonna put it up on the screen for you and I want you to see here uh, he says be on your guard stand firm in your faith be courageous be strong and do everything in love. There are five pillars for building a strong family right there. There are five statements, five encouragements, five challenges. And so whether you are a single mom or single dad, these five encouragements apply to you. If you are single, these five statements apply to you. If you are a blended family, if you're a first family, if you are a first family and you're at the top of your game or at the bottom of the mount, uh, bottom in the deepest, darkest valley you and your family have ever been in, here are five principles that regardless of where we are, and there are those here who you are widows. And you have kids and grandkids. There are those who are here that you are widowers. These five principles apply to everyone in this room if we want to build strong family units. And so let's read that again. He says, be on your guard, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything in love. So let's look at those five pillars of a strong family. Pillar number one is this, and this is what Paul says. He says, be on your guard against, and let me just write in this. I want to encourage you to write this in or open up your app. Uh, hopefully you have the sermon note insert. Write this. Be on your guard against what? Against unhealthy choices or sinful choices. Men, women, uh, uh, singles, married, blended families, traditional first families. Man, it doesn't matter if you are a single mom, single dad, any, whoever, whoever you are, young person. Be on your guard against unhealthy choices, against sinful choices. We will always be faced with sinful choices. I remember right after I surrendered the ministry a number of years ago, one of the very first classes I took was a, a class called uh, uh, Church Evangelism. And uh, in that class, we were taught by a man named Sumner Wimp. Some of you may know him. Uh, he traveled with Billy Graham a lot, and he, he, he did a lot of things. And Sumner was the nicest guy. He was the typical old pastor. And what I mean by that old-style pastor, he always wore the three-piece suit, it was a uh, uh, pants, you know, boot, uh, shoes, uh, jacket. He had the best. He always had a tie, and his tie always had the hanky that matched it. This guy was probably a hundred when he started teaching me. All right, and he had big earpieces because he could not hear, and he would talk real loud. And I, to this day, remember one day he's in class, and he's talking to the class, and we're young, and I'm single at the time, and he, you know, he's been married forever to his wife, and just had a great impact on us. I remember him talking. He says, guys, be on your guard. And he was talking to guys. He was single out the guys. And he goes, you will always have to be on your guard. And then in an honest evaluation, he goes, I know what you're looking at. You're saying, Sumner, when I get to be your age, I won't have to deal with temptation. And I remember him saying, boy, as long as there is red blood flowing through your veins, you are going to have to be on your guard. And that is a truth. 
Ladies, as long as there is blood flowing through our veins, men, as long as there, are blood, there is blood flowing through our veins, young person, as long as there, are blood, there is blood flowing through our veins, we are going to have to be on our guard against sinful and unhealthy choices. And let me tell you what, Satan and the world will draw you in as best they can. Look at what Proverbs says, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 28, we'll put it up on the screen. He says, the prospect of the righteous is joy. But the hopes or the actions of the wicked ultimately come to nothing. In other words, you can pursue whatever you want to, but if you are pursuing righteousness, you will find joy. If you are pursuing wickedness, it might be way down the road, but ultimately you will reap what you sow. As we think about the path of joy... You, I, I was just doing some research this week, and uh, man, there have been many people that have pursued many things. A man named Voltaire uh, was an active atheist, pushed for unbelief, applauded uh, his unbelief. When he got to the end of his road, right before he died, he says, I wish I had never been born. See, you can walk away from God all you want, but when you get to the end of your road, you need meaning in your life. Uh, what about pleasure, Lord Byron? Byron uh, he had more pleasure. He lived his life seeking pleasure. When he came to the end of his road, he said, the worm, the canker, and the grief are all mine. Man, is that the end of the road? Is that what you want if you just constantly and consistently pursue uh, money? Uh, what about money? Our pleasure. What about money? Jay Gould, American millionaire. Uh, man, he was loaded. At the end of his life, here's what he wrote in his, on his deathbed. He says, I suppose I'm probably the most miserable rich man on planet Earth. It doesn't matter if you pursue pleasure, if you pursue money, if you pursue power, if you pursue it in an ungodly and an unrighteous way, whether you're a man or woman, whether you're single or married, it will end in ruin. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. He says, the path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. You know, there are no do-overs. We can't undo yesterday's decisions or yesterday's passions or last year's decisions or last year's passions, but we can start today. And today I want to encourage you to be on your guard from this point forward against unhealthy and sinful passions. Here's number two, stand firm in your faith regardless of the consequences. Stand firm in your faith regardless of the consequences. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what social media says. It doesn't matter what movie star or what politician, uh, whoever it is. Don't ever let someone cause you to shrink back from your faith. And then dads or moms or parents begin to train your children. Man, stand firm in your faith. It doesn't matter what the consequences are. If we will simply stand firm. And there, there is a season where if you look back uh, in, in where I am in my life, even as your pastor, that uh, my youngest child now will be a senior in high school. You know what that means? We are almost empty nesters in Jesus' name. <laughs> right. And the reality of it is, that, you know, for me to train them, it's harder today than it was when they were kids. How many of you know that? Anybody in here like me say, I wish I would have done better when they were littler? I do. We all should. But you know what I can do? I can start today, right? Now, I want you to know, dads or moms, if, if you have not been training your kids up, if you have not been dropping those verses and those devotion seasons, don't start today by calling them all together and preach your first message ever and make it two and a half hours long. <laughs> they will not show back up. Trust me, I've been doing that for years. The reality of it is we just got to pr- impress upon our kids. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Put it up there on the screen. He says, not only do we need to stand firm in our faith, we need to teach it to our kids, but it can't be taught to our kids until we do it ourselves, men. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Where is he starting? With you. You can't go send your kid 
to church. You can't take him to VBS, uh, dad or mom. You can't take uh, him or her uh, to student ministry or, or children's ministry and ask them to impress upon their hearts something you don't reinforce and live at home. And so notice what he says, impress them on your heart. He says, these commandments I give to you today are to be on your hearts, first of all. Then after they're on your hearts, then you can impress them. And only then you can impress them on your children. You can talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands uh, and uh, bind them on your foreheads. He says, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You can't do one thing about yesterday, but you can start today. So thought number one is this, be on your guard against unhealthy and sinful choices. Number two, stand firm in your faith regardless of the consequences, but it first has to be your faith, then it's a faith given to our kids. And here's number three, be courageous, is what Paul says, with your resources and your relationships. Live with courage when it comes to your relationship as well as your resources. I'm reminded of a story I, I heard uh, years ago that, uh, that a dad was gathering around, had all of his family there on a Father's Day, and, and he was ready to pray as he always did. And so he began to pray. He began to pray and he, be, he began to say, God, you know, I'm not a perfect dad. I'm not this, but I just want to become the man of God that you want me to be. And so, God, if there's some way, somehow you can show me a sign. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of that prayer, everyone heard a poof. And they opened their eyes and there was an angel there. And everybody was kind of stunned. And the angel looked at dad and said, you can have anything you want. Your prayer impressed the heart of the father. If you want fame, Dad, you can have fame. If you want money, you can have money. If you want wisdom, you can have wisdom. You name it, God's going to grant it. Dad paused for a minute and said, as a father, I just want wisdom. And the angel went, poof, done. And the angel left. And all of a sudden, the kids begin to notice this halo around Dad's head. And then they begin to look at Dad's eyes. And they begin to see the halo begin to fade just a little bit. And finally, mom broke the silence, says, what's wrong, honey? He said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> the reality of it is that is where we are so often. We have to be courageous with our resources and our relationships. Notice what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Here's, here's your resources. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops. Then the barns, your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats uh, will brim over with new wine. Let me ask you a question. Single mom, single dad, blended family, uh, uh, traditional family, uh, single, those with a lot, those with very little. How faithful have you been with your resources to God? And how much have you let your kids know how faithful you've been with your resources to God? As we think about that, we have to be courageous. Let me tell you what, it takes courage to give a tenth. It takes courage to give beyond a tenth. It gave, takes courage to give a, a 13 or 14 or 15 percent. It takes courage with your resources. Let me ask you a question. Have you been faithful to train your kids to be faithful with the resources that God has given them? If you go read Deuteronomy chapter 8, God is honest. He just looks right at the children of Israel. He goes, I am the one that gives you the ability to produce wealth. So all the wealth we can produce, all the acumen that we have, all the work that we can do, God says, I gave you that ability. The question for you is, are you going to turn around and give back to God some of what he's allowed you to gain? And are we going to let our kids, or are we going to train our kids up, or are we going to teach our kids, whatever you get, spend more, because that's why God gave us a credit card. How faithful have you been with your resources in great times, in tough times, in prosperous times, in tight times. What about our relationships? That's our resources. Notice what it says uh, in Proverbs, always rolling through the Proverbs here in this series. Proverbs 13, verse 20 it says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools will suffer harm. What does that mean? Man, if you hang out with the three stooges, what are you going to be? You're going to be the four stooge, right? 
I mean, that is a real. How many of you ever looked at your kids and go, I just don't like your friends? Anybody ever had your kids says, I'm not a big fan of your friends either, Dad. <laughs> Moms, who are we hanging out with? We have to be courageous with our resources and our relationships. We have to be willing to say yes to the right kind of people and the right kind of relationship and no to the wrong kind of people and the wrong kind of relationship. And I want you to know it's not always popular. It's not always uh, following culture. Sometimes it's increasingly, incredibly countercultural. But if you and I are going to walk with God and build a strong family, we have to be willing from the first through the middle to the last to say yes to the right thing and no to the wrong thing. Here's your fourth idea. You ready? Be strong in your service to God and others. If you are going to be a strong family, you cannot be a selfish family. Selfish families are weak families. We have to be strong families that serve God and serve others. If you look back, if you think back over the last week or, or, or month, or man, what a blessing it was for us as a church. I, I, don't, I don't know when this has happened the last, but it, it happens because y'all are so faithful. When we were signing up for VBS, when we called it off, and then, we, then God created a new opportunity. One of our biggest fears, one of the things we prayed about as a senior staff is God re-energize our people to step up. We end up with 1,000 kids and 403 leaders. Man, that, give God a hand for that. that. That we literally, the week before we went to VBS, said, listen, if you want to serve, you're going to have to get on a wait list. Isn't that a neat thing? But you know what? That's not all of us. Because certainly there are those, as I talked about early in the service, there are those that you are here with many trajectories. Some of you have gotten here like Joseph, Joseph with a lifetime of serving God and others. There are others that you have been hot, you've been cold, you've served a little, I haven't served, I've done this, I've done that. There are others that you have, like Samson, wasted your ability to serve God and others to this point. But remember what Paul said in Philippians 3, Forgetting what lies behind, I strive forward to what lies ahead. The beauty of it is, it's so much more important, dads and moms, singles and married, what we start doing today than what we did 10 years ago. And that means serve God and others. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll put it up on the screen. He said, listen, do not. He says, therefore, my dear brothers, he says, and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Do not let anything move you. Always giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know what? That your labor in the Lord is never in vain. I want you to know, if you labor for God, man, there are times that it is going to be the greatest joy you ever, ever experience. There are going to be times that you labor for God and you serve God and you work God, and you're not going to enjoy it. I mean, you can see that from Genesis to Revelation and person after person in the disciple's life and the ladies who are following Jesus and planting churches. You can see that in everybody's life throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. There are going to be times when you just love it. But whatever you need to do, you can't stop serving God. We have to serve God and others with our whole heart and with our whole life. Let me tell you what, if all you want to do is serve money and all you want to do is make money, I will promise you, you will always want more money. If all you want is a position and everything you do is to serve someone so you can get a power, you get position, I will promise you, you will always simply want more power. If all you want to do with your life is, is serve yourself and gain pleasure and this pleasure and that pleasure, guess what? All you're going to leave yourself doing is wanting more pleasure and a different kind of pleasure. That plays itself out in life after life after life, in family after family after family, in man after woman. It doesn't matter. Boy, that's serving God. Do not stop serving God. If you haven't been serving God, do not not start serving God. 
What about others? Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. We want to serve God. Be strong in our service to God and others. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. He says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is within your power to act. Man, I, I love the people of Cottonwood. We have been a church of faith, walking and journeying and through ups and downs, through hardships, through good times, through celebrations like we had last year with a new chapel and the new children's ministry to this year where it's all seemed to fall apart because of one hell storm. But God just continues to move in the heart and life of our people because why? One of our heartbeats were we want to continue to give vacation Bible school to the people of this community, and we did. Man, but let me tell you what, that means we can never stop doing good when it's within our power to do it. Inside the family unit, Dad, doesn't matter what you've done up until today. Mom, it doesn't matter what you've done up until today. Son or daughter, it doesn't matter what you've done uh, up until today. Grandma, Grandpa, it doesn't matter what you've done up until today. Forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. What you do need to do is begin to invest in your kids and your family's life beginning today. That's what we do. Do not withhold good when it's within your power to start doing good today. Serve God. That builds a strong family and serve others. Here's the fifth pillar, ready? Do everything in love. Do everything in love. Let me just roll through these. All right, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna move through these quickly. How do I do that? How do I apply that? Whatever my whatever my uh, family status is, and I shared with you, there are many ways, many people that could have a family in here today. We all could have gotten here from a different place in a different space with your spouse. What do you do, husbands and wives? Uh, Proverbs three three. Uh, Let your love and your faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. This is starting today. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. Now, through love and faithfulness. Now, here I wanted to put this in here because remember, there are a lot of people that have arrived at this spot and your trajectory has been different. There are some of you that you are Joseph. You showed up today, grabbed your bacon, looked at a Harley, and all things are good. There are others in here that you're more like David. I've got a lot of good, but man, I've got some massive blunders that still weigh my family down right now. What do you do? Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Man, true love is a show me love. For God so loved the world that he showed us. How did he show it? He gave his one and only son to die on the cross for your sins and mine. It is a show me love. So with your spouse, show love, atone for it, be there, be faithful. With your children, how do you relate to your kids? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, start your children off in the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. In other words, and by the way, that's a proverb, that's not a promise. A proverb means this is a general principle. That if you are seeing one of your children, a son or a daughter, move away like the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter, trust that what you have trained them will bring them back. That's a proverb. It's a general principle. It'll come. What about with your parents? If you're a son or daughter here, if you have a mom or a dad, well, everybody has, has a mom and dad. But uh, if you didn't know that, I'll talk to you about that in a different series. With your parents, to the kids. And this is to me. I talk with my mom. Y'all know I talk, I talk with my mom this morning, all right? I, I learned a lot of things when I talked to my mom. I, I learned today every medication again that she was taking. I learned all of those things that's helping her out because she's got a sciatica. Uh, I don't know what a sciatica is, but it has something to do with the nerve. And, and she's got one, and she's taking this medication. And she asked me if I ever heard of this medication. I said, I've never heard of that medication. She goes, everybody I know is taking this medication. I said, well, I ought to give me some. Every Sunday morning, we talk on the phone. That doesn't make me a great son. What that makes me is someone who knows how to answer the phone when she calls me every Sunday morning, making sure I'm going to church. <laughs> She's still training me, right? Man, with your parents, what do you do? Proverbs 23, verse 22, and I show up because she says, get up and go to church. Listen to your father, it says, who gave you life. You ever had the dad, I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. Boy, haven't I thought about that. And do not despise your mother when she is old. 
Man, listen, just, just hang in there with your parents. Proverbs 10, verse 1, a wise son, son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. If you're a child, honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long and you may live prosperous life. What about with your words? If you're going to build a strong family, do everything in love with your spouse, with your children, with your parents, and with your words. Look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Those are five principles for building a strong family, regardless of where your trajectory has been that brought you to where you are. Those are five ideas to begin today to make your family into a strong family. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day, just to open your word and be honest. God, it, we do pity the man who shows up today like Samson did, one failure after another, but we celebrate the man that knows God's grace. God, we pity the woman who shows up today that has lived a life of failure after failure, but celebrate her when she finds the grace of God. For those who have lived their lives like Joseph, God, I thank you for the men and women in this room who've just done the right thing over and over again, and we celebrate that and the grace of God in their lives. For those who are like David, God, that there are mostly in sensing and walking in such a way that they are men and they are women, they are singles, they are married, they are young and they are old, and they are people who are like David after God's own heart. But God, we're reminded even in David's life that there were failures and they were significant ones and we celebrate God's grace. My prayer today is that the people of Cottonwood, both here in this uh, service as well as those watching online, would just take these five principles from God's Word and begin to apply them today because the point of our lives this day is to forget what lies behind and strain forward what lies ahead because that's where the joy is in jesus name we pray amen and amen